Welcome to the Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor. Now, here's your host, Tom Lindquist. Glad to have you back in the Leadership Lyceum, where we bring you direct access to top CEOs and directors of boards in an interview format that provides insight on situational issues that confront CEOs every day. It is a CEO's virtual mentor. ESG metrics. The head of ESG investments in Frankfurt. We're going to look at the ESG outlook for 2018. Can you start by explaining the difference between ethical, socially responsible and sustainable? Socially responsible investment. It's on every channel. (laughs) ESG. Welcome to episode 20. I'm joined by Pat Campling, chairwoman and chief executive officer of Alliant Energy in Madison, Wisconsin. This episode 20 covers several areas of topical interest, including a discussion on sustainability and the quickly emerging and rapidly evolving area of ESG, or environmental, social, and governance criteria. Institutional investors are demanding action and attention to ESG, and CEOs are responding by charting their company's course. And this is often not without tension. We'll discuss with Pat how she and Alliant have been addressing ESG, and we'll be right back to put you at ease. Stay tuned. Madison-based Alliant Energy has a $10.8 billion market cap as a public utility holding company that provides regulated electricity and gas service through its subsidiaries, Interstate Power & Light and Wisconsin Power & Light, to 410,000 gas customers and just shy of 1 million electric customers. Pat has served as chair and CEO since 2012, and prior to that, she was COO for about a year. And prior to that, she was CFO and treasurer and has an extensive finance background. Foundationally, Pat is an engineer and a registered professional engineer at that, a true Renaissance woman. Let's join our interview. I'd like to discuss Alliant in the context of the many parameters covered and discussed in your sustainability report. Is it a compliance requirement? Thanks for asking that question, because the sustainability report is something that I personally really care a lot about. And it's definitely evolved over the years. And it's not just in utility space, but almost all major corporations now have a sustainability report. What's really unique about that report is you can define it how you want it. Originally, ours started out as an environmental report, and then we started adding other elements. But this past year, we really broadened it for the UN principles, which really is very broad, not only on health and human safety, but education, the environment, your communities, et cetera. The UN Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI, are a set of six principles that provide a global standard for responsible investing as it relates to environmental, social, and corporate governance, or ESG, factors. Organizations follow these principles to meet commitments to beneficiaries while aligning investment activities with the broader interests of society. The PRI movement began in early 2005 when the then United Nations Secretary General, Kofi Annan, invited a group of the world's largest institutional investors to join a process to develop the principles for responsible investment. The principles were launched in April 2006 at the New York Stock Exchange. Since then, the number of signatories has grown from 100 to over 1,800. I'll briefly summarize the six principles that investor signatories publicly demonstrate. One, they incorporate ESG issues into investment analysis and decision-making processes. Two, they're active owners and incorporate ESG issues into their ownership policies and practices. Three, they seek appropriate disclosure on ESG issues by the entities in which they invest. Four, they promote acceptance and implementation of the principles within the investment industry. Five, they work together to enhance their effectiveness in implementing the principles. And six, they each report on their activities and progress toward implementing the principles. Sweeping in its reach, isn't it? But what triggered a Madison-based company to consider these UN principles as a guide? We were on a European investor trip in the springtime, and they were asking us how we were aligned with the UN goals. And I wasn't, to be honest with you, very familiar with them at the time. So we did a little research, and with the executive team, we were all pretty excited that, you know, that's how we wanted to demonstrate our commitments 
on many, many fronts about the organization. Is it evolving here in your investors in the United States? Absolutely. You know, it started in Europe with the environmental questions, and we love going to Europe. Number one, we have quite a few European investors, but we just learned so much about how they analyze corporations. So it's a great education for us to spend a week over there. We usually go every other year. I think we might need to move that up to go every year just because the discussions are evolving so fast. And I'd say the last five years, you definitely see it in the U.S., especially a lot of the large investment houses with different diversity goals, mandates that, you know, they want to make sure there's diversity on the board, diversity in executive ranks, but also, again, that we're good corporate citizens and really committed to a good workforce. We've always had investors that cared a lot about our environmental profile. You know, we do still burn coal. We've definitely reduced the amount of coal that we're burning, uh, retired about half of our generation fleet. But a lot of this started really coming out on carbon issues, other environmental issues, compliance issues. I'd call it originally, it was more of a compliance report on how we were meeting rules and regulations. Then it's definitely evolved over time. Investors were caring very early on about our environmental profile. But what's interesting, we started getting a lot more questions on governance items then and a lot of diversity issues, et cetera. And it gave us the opportunity then over the last five years to evolve our sustainability report. But the investor base has definitely changed on the expectations they have. They want to make sure that the companies they invest in are very aligned on the same long-term goals, especially environment, diversity, how you treat people, and how you treat your communities. And you make sure you're a good partner. One of the things I tell our employees all the time are, we operate in these small communities. We have to be good neighbors on every front, whatever we do. And they really take that to heart. And you can see that in the report. We go through a lot of debate on what we should be calling that report because sustainability is such a broad term that everybody uses. Right. So we haven't come up with a better term yet. So we're sticking with that one for the meantime. Historically, they had the management discussion and analysis to put some subjective context around the financials. And now this adds another layer, another component that they can really see more on leadership and more about what is important for you as, as a CEO and leader of the organization. No, that, that's a very good point. And, you know, the investors do expect and they should demand with a good investment, good returns, solid returns. But the way you manage your corporation now is also very important to them. So they expect both good returns, good management style, but also making sure that corporations are good corporate citizens as well and actually model the values that their firms have as well. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with Pat Campling, Chairwoman and Chief Executive Officer of Alliant Energy. We're back with Pat Campling. We've been speaking about the investor base expectations related to ESG. Not to get you into politics, but it seems like the investor base cuts through what may be going on politically in terms of those values around the environment. That is so true. And I said, what's really exciting for me is that finally discussing a good, clean environment, sustainable environment is not a political issue. It's something we all want, and where the politics have gotten involved, at least in the two states that we operated in, was not necessarily wanting to undo rules. It was really states' rights versus federal rights, and who was going to tell the states what to do. But that was still is very political, so it was really nice to get beyond all this right now so we can have a joint effort, bipartisan, on making sure our environment is a great environment going forward. To go into the components of the sustainability report to be named uh, something more appropriate later. (laughs) It is interesting, and and knowing that you had the latitude to select the areas that you'd cover, I point out safety first, employees and public safety, in really dealing with both the employees and public safety. Why both employees and public safety in the in the safety realm. Yeah, you know, the utility business, you've always had a great focus on safety, but it's never good enough. You know, we still have people that do get hurt. Thank God we haven't had a lot of serious injuries at our organization, but this is dangerous work that our folks do. And a lot of times it's in dangerous circumstances. So we, number one, we really stress the fact that we want every employee to go home safe every day. But we also believe because we're so visible in the communities that we're also good role models for safety. We don't mind sharing our safety programs with others, with our customers. We actually learn from each other. But we are out in the public, and public safety is 
totally important to us. And in some way or another, the utilities touch every home. So making sure that we've got rules and discipline, but also that we're very outspoken when we see unsafe conditions happening in our communities, not just unsafe for you know, our employees, but for the, the people that we serve. We really take that responsibility to heart. So we actually go so far as even our contractors, vendors that work for us, they have to adhere to very strict safety standards. We make sure that they all abide by, you know, are very strict. And the IBEW does a wonderful job on rules to live by, making sure nobody gets hurt. So this is another thing that's very bipartisan. It's very joint, but we can be really good role models on setting the stage for safety in our communities as well. In the safety context, the complexity of having both electric and gas, and especially in the in the wake of some of the gas industry mm-hmm. tragedies with Massachusetts and Nysource or Columbia and with PG&E a few years ago, how do you manage the two, electric and gas? I'd say we have a comprehensive safety program on all fronts, but there are definitely different compliance programs and integrity programs between electric and gas. Mm-hmm. One of our bigger issues with gas our gas system is actually relatively new compared to most utilities. We don't serve any major cities, old cities, so our system is relatively new. But one of the bigger issues we have are people just hitting the lines. Contractors digging into the lines, especially they don't call a digger's hotline yeah. to get the lines marked. That is just not acceptable. So going back to public safety, one of the things we're very strong on, working with both of our states and the attorney general's office, is we'll go after these contractors that are repeat violators. And I can tell you, that's few and far between. Most contractors that might hit a line, absolutely, they feel terrible about it. Yeah. And we're lucky, again, we haven't had any incidents like some of those that you mentioned because those are just horrific. But we have a really strict integrity program where we check the lines, make sure there's no leaks, make sure we know exactly where they are, where they're located, and make sure, and we have advertisements and everything else, when people smell gas, get out of your house mm-hmm. and then call 911. Thank goodness, again, it's few and far between where there's any issues. Your supply chain area is actually embedded in the culture section of your report. Why is that? Why do you embed it in culture? I don't have a really crisp answer for sure, you on that that's one. Fine. But when we look at our suppliers and we look at our contractors, we're a people business. And they're people as well. We hold our folks that we have on the property or working for us or working with us to the same standards on how you treat people, ethics, values, safety. We treat them all like family. They're mm-hmm. all family. And we have an expectation when you're working for us, no matter where you are. So I'm sure, I'm sure there was a little bit of debate internally where it belonged, but we have a lot of third parties working for us as well, and uh, we just want to make sure that they understand that they are part of the family, but they're going to be held to the same standards. As we go to break, we end the section on ESG. On a hopeful note, while the sweeping breadth of ESG can be daunting for management and investor relations teams to cover, it may offer a broader canvas to tell the company's story beyond what would be typical in a MDNA or in an investor presentation. ESG is so boundaryless and seems to be so highly subjective in what can or should be covered that management can emphasize the unique points about their company. From one perspective, then, ESG can be highly enabling for stakeholder communications. We'll be right back with Pat Campling. We're back with Pat Campling, Chairwoman and CEO of Alliant Energy. We left for the break talking about supply chain, but Pat's reference to family revealed some culture undertones. Pat, I saw you maybe four or five, six years ago speak at an industry event on culture. What does culture mean to you all here? You know, it was really interesting. I know exactly the presentation you're talking about. You had a very diverse group of CEOs there. You couldn't have asked for four more different individuals, but we all had the same message, which was really nice at the end of the day. It was a packed crowd. It was a presentation on the importance of culture at an annual meeting of the Edison Electric Institute, the industry association serving investor-owned electric utility members. The subject on leadership and culture was an atypical topic for the setting of the conference, but the room was packed and vibrant. It was one of the best panels that I've seen, actually. Was it? No, I appreciate that. And we actually didn't know each other before that panel. Oh, Isn't that's that amazing. interesting? Yeah, yeah they, they got this. There was two, chemistry they, between we you. Had, all. We did not meet each other to that day. But what was interesting, so I'll go back to the year before when I became CEO. 
I got a call from one of my friends that I worked with, you know, prior, my prior organization, Exelon, and said, congratulations, Pat, being CEO. Now you get to shape the culture. I'm like, shape the culture? At the time, I really didn't understand that that was my job. But basically, as CEO, you got to you help shape the culture. What's exciting about Alliance Energy right now is we see the industry changing so fast. And in order to get an organization working together, you have to have shared values. I keep using the word values again. But part of culture shaping is about having open and honest dialogue with folks so you're willing to take risks and move forward and knowing what the acceptable boundaries are. I take culture very personally because I picked my organizations where I wanted to work based on the company culture. And I learned that from a cousin of mine, and she, to this day she doesn't remember telling me that, but she was a little older than, than me, and uh, she was in banking, so you think about banking in the 70s. And here I'm an engineer graduating from college in the early 80s. But she was very observant about why kind of companies would accept women early on. So she made me more aware of how I fit into the organization. But culture is the welcoming part of the organization. So that's really been a big push for me. But also on culture, delightful Midwest company. I mean, I grew up in New York City. So working in Wisconsin and Iowa, it's paradise. It's absolutely wonderful working up here. And you've got people that are just so kind and nice. But culture still matters. Culture still matters. So making sure, and I'll give you the sustainability report, was a great piece of the culture because our employees just worked so hard on that. Everybody had a part of that in the organization. Lots of great ideas because they all just wanted to help shape the culture and share our story through that report. So, But it's very important to make sure the organization's aligned. And if you've got clashing cultures in the organization, um, that's not very productive. I would tell you, a good culture, focusing on culture, makes the organization not only better, financially better, better to work at, and it really pushes people in their careers. Did you reshape it when you became, at the time, chairman, president, CEO? It's not just coming to work, moving stuff around. And I'm not saying it was back then, but every employee comes to work today now knowing we serve customers. And what's the best customer experience for that person? Not necessarily the best experience for the employee. What was it like before? What would have been their main focus? Their job? Just, it was like coming come in and doing their job, and you know, we're, we have a lot of processes in place and procedures to follow, et cetera, and all good and good people. But just having them have that extra special lens to what does this mean for the customer at the end of the day, I think we're upping our game and, and satisfying customers. And, you know, in this industry, you have a lot of debate. Is, is the customer the end user or is the regulator? And we're like, no, the customer is the person that gets our service. We go through regulatory processes, but you've got to really focus on how we serve customers each day. So simple things like updating the billing system, giving customers easier ways to pay, making sure we communicate with them on their terms, not necessarily the way we want to communicate. So even changing our jobs, the daily jobs, especially the ones that interface with the customers, to meet the customers the way they want to be met, not necessarily the one way that we like to communicate. So that's still evolving, and it's evolving as an industry. But just having every employee understand that they serve customers it's just a different type of employee, and they come to work every day. So what was the telltale sign or evidence that they were focused on the customer? You no, know, my telltale sign is I get a lot more thank you letters from customers today, a lot more than I do complaints. I'm not very often, as a customer anywhere, prone to say thank you as much as to complain. And so to have that balance tip the other way is that is a telltale sign. Well, and the other change I would tell you culturally is that we want our employees to be involved in our communities. And the volunteer efforts that our employees put on, you probably saw a little bit in the sustainability report mm-hmm. as well. And we've got very active employee resource groups and let them, you know, we don't manage that for them. We let them pick. But the most common thing that folks like to do is be with each other and do community service projects. And all fronts, all fronts. They'll be cleaning up the uh, Humane Society one day, they'll be painting classrooms another day, building habitat houses, yeah. helping tutor children. But it's really important, and you really see that connection with our employees today. So again, another big cultural change. We're allowing them to do that. We're encouraging them to do that. And boy, that really, um, we actually allow our attorneys to do pro bono work. And that is so rewarding for them to go help. We've got a group that actually does wills for heroes. So police, firemen, military, they'll do the wills for them. With the tornado in, in Iowa, we had our attorneys go help them with their insurance claims. Oh, wow. That's you know, amazing. So, yeah, it's been an amazing feat, but you just give your employees, you empower your employees. It's amazing what they can do. Is there something systematic or programmatic that you're doing from a corporate development standpoint? And I hate to say manage something that is intended to be 
sort of just in everybody's DNA, right. but is there some way that you're communicating to the community that you're open to mm -hmm. being involved in this way? Yeah, so a couple of things. You know, we have an Alliance Energy Foundation, so they're the conduit for a lot of these activities, a lot of the asks. Uh, we have a very active employee base that goes to schools working on STEM. So we use our conduit as the funnel. And then you'd be surprised, you know, especially those of us that had kids in school districts, you hear about something going on at the school, so even one of our employees might say, hey, this, this high school or this middle school is looking for something here, so they'll bring us to that. So we don't have it so structured, but we have conduits in place to at least funnel the information. And then we actually have, I just noticed that it's like sign-up genius, you know, and we need some volunteers to do some work. They've already got that system in place where you can just, you know, need five volunteers this day, ten this day. So we all have it all online now. But I tell you, we have more people that want to volunteer than we have spots a lot of the time. So we, we encourage folks, please bring us more, more activities to do. And these folks are all doing it on the free time. We'll be right back with Pat Campling and the conclusion of the program. We're back with Pat Campling, Chairwoman and CEO of Alliant Energy, and the conclusion of our episode. Wanted to talk about moving from CFO to CEO. What was it like for you? What were some of the key evolutionary yeah. steps that you had to go through? Sure. You know, first, I'll tell you the first step is really sitting down with my board before I, I said, yes, I would take the position to find out exactly what they were looking for in a CEO. I'm very different than my predecessor, who was very different from his predecessor, and just making sure that you know you're aligned with your board on what your expectations were. So that was delightful, to be honest with you. Great conversation. That was really, really good. And I'll be honest, I think a CFO has a little bit of an unfair advantage transitioning to CEO because you already know the investor base. You spend a lot of time with investors. You already know board dynamics. You've been in enough board meetings. You know the comp well enough. I'll say, well, you definitely need to have more to learn, but you know it well enough because so much of the comp is based on incentive pay and stock performance. So you actually have an unfair advantage, I would say, at least dealing with the board. But the hard part and the transition part, and this is where the board's guidance is so helpful, is helping you figure out who you go to for guidance, where to push you. I keep saying my organization has pushed us more than we were maybe comfortable to go. I have a board member that keeps saying, you work your best when you're out of your comfort zone. So our board is very good at pushing us into the right direction being a little more aggressive on speed. And that's really the discussions that once you're CEO and you're setting the speed of the organization, mm -hmm. that it's helpful to have the board on. And I never appreciated that being CFO, because CFO, you have a calendar. But just addressing the speed of the organization is a bit of a balance. I, get, I tell folks it's like leading the orchestra, the conductor. You have to make sure everybody's in sync, which is really exciting, but takes more time than you think. Well, I'm fascinated by that. How do you increase the tempo of the organization then? I'll be honest, cut back on meetings. I'm very strict on I mean, meetings time. I actually was telling folks that even at my staff meetings, we have a facilitator. Make sure we stay on topic, get stuff done. One of the executives will volunteer to be facilitators. But just making sure the administration of running the organization and, quite frankly, getting out talking to people. I don't need more reports. You know, we're really cutting back on reports, et cetera. But just get real-time information from the folks on the front line and through the organization and empowering them to, you know, I don't need this report. And I keep saying, if I'm asking for a re if you hear I'm asking for a report, that's not accurate. I don't ask for anything that's not normally generated in the organization. But speed is really about just uncluttering people's day. We got to unclutter their day so they can put their minds to work and go faster and give them permission to go faster. Have you seen positive movement oh, there? Oh, I have for sure. I've seen it not only in the executive team, but the folks below that. And now they're questioning, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And so you, you definitely see that. And, you know, some organizations go faster than others. So sometimes you got to say, well, wait a second, they're not caught up yet. You know, and I tell my team, because I get asked the question all the time, well, how do you stay current on everything? It's like, I'm like that's impossible, but I catch up. So you got to pick your times on when to catch up. And I don't need to catch up on everything. You don't need to be involved in everything, but just picking the topics. We call them blue chip items, as you're aware. Picking your items on when to get caught up on. And the other thing, my team knows me well enough that they know what I want to know about. So, ooh, Pat might want to hear about this one, or oh, I can't wait to tell Pat about this. You know, so you got to make sure you know your team well enough that they know exactly what you want to know and that they know that they're empowered to move forward faster. 
So how much time of your day do you spend walking around and being out of your office? Probably not as much as I want, but I, I probably spend a few hours a day just talking to people. You get more information that way than you do anything else. And we've cut our staff meetings in half because I want my folks out with their people more. I wish I was out more, but, and a lot of my job is meeting with customers and elected officials, et cetera, but you hear a lot. With the staff meeting, I don't mean to get too detailed, no, but, but I'm, I'm actually fascinated by this. With the staff meeting, there were probably very typical agenda mm-hmm. items on the staff meeting. What did you cut? What did you think was superfluous? So there's a couple of items that we talk about at every staff meeting. One is talent, and it's all round table, nothing mm-hmm. structured. Who did something remarkable in our staff? You know, let's talk about some of our, our key people that we need to know about. We talk about safety, always have a safety share and a safety moment. We also now have a culture share. And last month it was gratitude. Are we showing enough gratitude to our employees? So very different staff meetings than years ago. But the other thing is we only have key items on the agenda, routine stuff. And if it's, I'd say, monthly financial update, that's just posted, unless mm-hmm. there's something that has to be called out. But yeah, we used to have more of a structured meeting. Now it's like, what are the five key things we need to discuss this month? which makes the meetings just a lot more fun because they're all different. And we also use it to say, who do we need visibility into? Who's one of our, you know, leading high performers that we want a little bit more visibility into? Let's find an agenda item for them to come speak to us on. So it's very fluid, Mm -hmm. except for those few topics that are standard. Everything's very fluid, different topics every month. That's great. And I guess you have a facilitator there to keep it moving. Make sure, and nobody can speak for more than 20 minutes. I was talking to a CEO uh, just last week, and... She was saying how she um, got her staff to go from 50-page presentations to 30, and her goal is 10. And we just actually stopped the presentations. We don't even need presentations. Oh, God, just yeah. talk to us. You know, sometimes a page or two is good, but, you know, they're not encouraging PowerPoints anymore. Well, and if you look back at the time put into those PowerPoints, oh, it must be a week. It has uh, to be. To, and, and probably more than that in the development to get to the point where you're putting it on a PowerPoint. Absolutely. Even our board meetings have evolved that way, where there's not, the, you know, you got standard stuff boards have to review but the topics that go to the board are very different each month. It's interesting, the whole tempo, speed concept. I know everybody would prefer to do it faster, and I liken it to maybe a sports analogy in soccer where you want tempo, really Mm -hmm. fast tempo, and the way you achieve it is one touch passing. You're not dribbling, you're not speaking for more than 20 minutes, you're keeping things moving, and that's pretty fascinating that you're focused on tempo. Tempo, tempo is important, and the other thing with having a facilitator at a meeting, and I encourage people to do this at all levels of an organization, is then let the quiet voices be heard. You know, so so many meetings, there's a couple of people that just wanna, you know, they monopolize the room. Exactly. They're not unkind people, it's just who they are. But having the facilitator to make sure the quiet voices get heard is just really important. Yeah, and I guess if there's a facilitator in the room and you're in the room too, you can look down the table then Mm -hmm. and you're not so focused Mm -hmm. on, you know, agenda items as you are looking around the room and focusing on the dynamic. Because originally when I was doing both, you're exactly right. I was the facilitator, not a participant. So now I can be a participant at my own staff meetings. (laughs) Pat, I thank you so much. Oh, this has been delightful, and I really appreciate the time talking to you, Tom. We've known each other for a long time, and I appreciate you doing this. But what I tell young folks out there is the CEO is the most liberating job in the world. And I tell people that because if I don't like what's going on, I just I have a mirror in, on my wall in my office. I look in the mirror. I can change it. I tell people it's a very liberating job. Just all aspire to it. Well, let's all do it. And certainly a CEO's virtual mentor, and, and you're— <laughs> Being a guest on here, hopefully that will help people get along. I'm sure it will. And thanks, Pat. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was was fun, Tom. Thank you. We hope you found this episode 20 featuring Pat Campling informative and educational. We're especially honored to feature Pat in this episode. You see, after our interview, and as we were going to final production of this episode, Pat announced her retirement effective July 1st, 2019. Pat joined Alliant in 2005 and was appointed as chair and CEO in 2012. She will have served Alliant seven years as CEO. At the Lyceum, we celebrate executive retirement in Spanish. You see, the English verb to retire does not really capture the event properly. In Spanish, to retire is jubilar, like jubilant. That is, feeling or expressing great happiness and triumph. So, Pat, we express los mejores deseos de un larga y feliz jubilación. Keep your eyes out just prior to April 22nd for episode 21, 
featuring Mr. Ralph Izzo, Chairman, President, and CEO of publicly traded utility PSEG in Newark, New Jersey. Ralph will be my guest in our Earth Day episode. Fitting for Earth Day, we'll discuss what Ralph considers to be the foremost challenge of our generation, climate change. Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor, has been a production of the Leadership Lyceum, LLC. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.